So hi guys, welcome along to today's video. I hope you're all looking after yourselves. Today we're going to be taking this Aprilia RSV Milli Haga Rep out for a ride, a little walk around, and basically explain what it's like to live with. We've got a dish. We've got a dish for the Carbonara. It just goads you to ride it harder and faster as any Italian beauty would do. A Bob Dovalina! jump aboard it's a little bit windy today so I hope you can hear me all right and we'll talk you through it ah oh, the old uh, the fuel lights on already so we'll have to do a little fuel stop on the way let's go so guys this is an Aprilia RSV Milli uh, this is a special Haga edition uh, basically the Mini was built from 1998 through to 2003 and the standard Mini um, standard Mini was a big V-twin, 1000cc uh, pretty as first foray into big motorcycles before that it was 125s and 250s and then they brought out the Mini R which had additional Olins, uh, forks, shock, steering damper Osforge wheels um, lots of carbon fibre and lots of nice trick bits on it and then they also bought out some special editions one of them is this so this is the is the 2002 milli R Harger edition so with the Harger edition there was only 300 made 60 went across to the US uh, that means only 240 ever in the UK, so a very rare big Italian litre superbike, number superbike, so a special machine. They came basically the same as the R, except they also had a numbered anodised headstock, which I'll show you when we walk around the bike later. Twin Akapovic exhaust rather than a single, and an EEPROM chip to uh, recalibrate the ECU for those twin exhausts. They also had uh, the Noriyuki Haga replica paintwork from the factory of the WSP, the World Superbike uh, bike of the time. So yeah, it's a lovely thing, as, any, as with any pretty RSV, it's all about this big, big V-twin engine. We got a, a 60 degree 998cc V-twin lump between our legs. So as pretty as first foray into big super bikes. The, the actual engine itself was built by Austrian company Rotax. Super reliable engine. Made I think 130 horsepower and about 76 foot pound of torque in stock form. Uh, this Harger edition with the EEPROM chip in it makes about I think three horsepower over that stock figure. Um, at, to, at peak power but about 10 higher in the mid range which is where it really counts which is where you get the torque and the V-twin uh, I believe the standard RSV was around 210 kilos wet as well so quite a light bike for its time and obviously the R and the Milli again would have been even lighter than that so really really good performance figures out of the box in the day, they cost, uh, I believe, £10,800 for the Harger edition. Uh, about £800,000 more than the standard R. So lots of lots of goodies for your money there. For the extra £800. And their low mileage examples now are just about starting to fetch really good money, similar to that uh, original asking price. Slightly less for the higher mileage editions, but it's just the scarcity of them. Um, how rare they are and how rare they're fi to find them in unmolested condition as with any big Italian superbike so I've had this one now for around 7 years probably covered just over 18,000 miles on it 
don't do many miles on it to be fair we just sort of we take it for the MOT take it out now and again keep on top of it um, just take it out when you want to have a little bit of fun and um, which it certainly certainly is so it's over 20 years old now um, and I've ridden Triumphs, Hondas, Suzuki's obviously this Aprilia, Yamaha's all sorts of bikes and I have to say that this Aprilia has been so good to me that it has really swayed my mind in the biking world. The only bike that I would next like to buy out of all the options out there is the V4 Tuono and one of the main reasons for that is because of the ownership of this Aprilia. Now I think you'll hear some horror stories where you get one of these and either people have absolutely no problems with them or people have nothing but problems with them. Um, as if it was a Friday afternoon job in the factory. But I've had Touchwood, very good a pretty ownership experience. Obviously I'm an engineer myself, so a lot of the maintenance, valve clearances, um, any bits and pieces work needs doing on it hasn't been a big drama for me. But even if it is, they're not massively expensive to upkeep either because it's got an old simple bike. It's not like the new generation of super, super bikes with all the electronics on them and engine management, etc. where you have to take it into a dealership to get it plugged in and see what's going on. Quite a simple thing to fix and parts are relatively inexpensive. So not a difficult bike to maintain on that front. So we're going to put some fuel in there. It's natural hunting ground of the fuel station. Not got a particularly large tank on it and it just goads you to ride it harder and faster as any Italian beauty would do. So uh, that's why it's always in the fuel station. I think you probably get around 120, 110 miles to a full tank, somewhere around that sort of figure. But if you're buying one of these for the fuel consumption, you're buying the wrong motorcycle. So. There we go guys, fuel light was on and we've just managed to squeeze in 13 litres of the super duper unleaded. So you'll find with these bikes the fuel light will come on and it'll go off, then it'll come on, then it'll go off, then it'll come on, or maybe it's just this one, but that's definitely my experience with this Aprilia. So when it comes on, I just like to fill it up and then there we go. So let's go and uh, carry on where we were. So let's start by explaining uh, what it's like to own one of these. I say it's good to live with, however, there are a few little quirks and a few little foibles of these bikes. Um, so let's get over the, all the bad bits first of all, shall we? Let's talk about the bad bits. Well, not so good bits, I should say. It's still a fantastic motorcycle. But going through town, going through slow traffic, it is not particularly comfortable. There's a lot of weight on your wrists. It's very wrist heavy. It's a big lumpy V-twin. Doesn't like to sit around at low RPM. Just wants to go. It's really a thoroughbred race machine, so the gearbox can be a little bit clunky at lower, lower speeds, lower RPM, um, and the clutch is particularly heavy. So the only way I've ever found to consistently get this into neutral is to be coming up to a set of traffic lights like this in second gear and just pull the clutch in and gently tap the foot peg to get it dropped down into neutral. If you go too far, the gate is so close between first and second, and the neutral gate is so small, but if you go too far with it, you are going to drop it into first gear. Once you drop it into first, you won't get it back into second sitting at the lights. So the only way I've found to do it is to roll it up to, when you're rolling up to the lights. 
if you do drop it into first and you got to hold the clutch in at a set of red lights it's okay once but once you've done it once or twice you'll find the clutch can be, get really really heavy um, so they are hydraulic clutch but the clutch can still get very very heavy obviously it's got to be a fairly heavy duty clutch to handle all this power not ideal for sitting at the lights with your hand holding it in pulling it in it can also on very very warm days they can run a little bit hot when you're sitting in traffic um, it's basically it's a machine that has been built to go fast to look pretty and to sound like thunder so the last thing it wants to be doing is sitting like this in built up traffic in areas with the clutch pulled in it's just wanting to go um, other parts of the ownership not so good maybe the side stand the side stand it leans it's a bit short and it leans over really really far so people tend to put honda fire blade side stands on there that helps keep them upright i have heard that if you leave it running on the side stand it can actually tip over so i've always kept it on a paddock stand never had any issues but something to be aware of uh, typical italian uh, idiosyncrasy i suppose is on the rear caliper it's got a nice underslung Brembo rear caliper on it however they put the bleed nipple at the bottom of the caliper so you can't or you really struggle to bleed the air out of the caliper so when you do bleed the brakes out you need to take the caliper off put it to the top of the disc bleed the brake up turn it over put it to the top bleed it and then refit it uh, that's a, just a, a typical Italian little quirk and obviously being Italian it is allergic to water so you do not want to take this out if it's wet or raining as none of the connectors on any of the wiring harness have got any IP rating whatsoever so it will turn into a gremlin if you take it out in the water so try and keep it for days like today when it's just a nice warm sunny dry day that's when they're they're most at home but I mean, every, every one of these bikes has got little bits and pieces like that you learn to live with. Like I said earlier on, owning this Aprilia has really made me love the Aprilia brand and want to buy another one, to be honest. They're the big, big thing of any motorcycle, every motorcycle's got forks, shocks, swing arms, tyres, wheels, brakes, but the engines are what really set them apart. The character of the different engines in these machines is really what makes the bike. A bit like a Harley, similar sort of thing. So having this big thumping V-twin between your legs is what this bike is all about. Uh, so they're the, the not so good bits, but the, the, better, the better bits we'll get on to now. So I have had this on track, I've had this around Snetterton, and I have to say when you get it up to not racing speeds but a higher performance speed it absolutely works it just clicks all together that jerky gearbox or clunky gearbox is seamless at higher rpms the engine braking from the big thousand cv twin is just like even just shutting the throttle is like you have hit a wall so that really helps stabilize the bike on the brakes um, the suspension is sublime especially for the year of the suspension I mean the UK roads now are awful however this is uh, the, the forks have been serviced on this and the shocks have been serviced it's got fresh oil in and they just ride the bump so so well as long as you've got it set up to your weight you're not bottom in the mount it does really ride the road perfectly so for 20 year old or 20 year old plus suspension factory stuff it is really really sublime i love it it is quite a big bike physically um, when you stand back and look at it this era this generation of bike a big rear seat hump um, actual physical size of it but because of the lightweight nature of the bike and the v-twin being narrow between your legs you really don't feel that when you're riding along it's a very light flippable bike side to side i mean this is running some um pirelli uh, Angel GT tyres on it, a bit harder wearing, a bit more durable, being a big V-twin you can chew through a rear tyre on a thousand miles, so this has got something just slightly more durable on it, and even with that tyre on that profile, it still just turns on its side whenever you get to a corner, so don't be put off by the size of it, so when you're actually riding along, it is far far more agile than what it looks, it's just kind of, that's how big they were for that era. The bars are quite nice and wide, um, 
wide forward bars which I quite like gives you a lot of leverage to be turning the bike around uh, we got the Brembo brakes on the front and the rear unbelievable stopping power for the era obviously modern super bikes will far outperform it but for the speed the thing's got you want to have good brakes and they definitely inspire confidence that they will slow you down when you really start tugging on them and warming them up so good brakes good suspension fantastic handling obviously a brilliant built the chassis so our chassis and swing arm so we've got superb handling superb noise as you would expect and yeah I say it's really is a, a collection of all the best parts with the uh, forged Oz wheels Brembo brakes, Olin suspension and shock and steering damper, Rotax engine, a pretty chassis and swing arm. I mean, the, the competition at the time of this era of Superbike was the Ducati 998909. You had the SP2 from Honda and you had the TL1000R and S from Suzuki. And I would have to say that for the money, for what you get and the goodies that are hanging off of this, that look like jewellery when you stand back and have a look it is well well worth the money compared um, being a big v-twin it is slightly different to other stuff if you're not a fan of riding big v-twins it's not going to be for you because like i say it's all about that engine but something that did surprise me i suppose is being a big v-twin you think it's got loads of torque which it has got a lot of torque don't get me wrong but it doesn't like to sit and chug along at sort of 3000 rpm in a high gear it still likes to be revved quite high this if you're revving it sort of four four and a half thousand rpm as you're going along it definitely gives you a smoother ride in it so it's a smoother throttle control it's not as jerky it feels nice and smooth for a big v-twin Another reason that I love these bikes so much is that it's analogue. So no traction control, no anti-wheelie, no six-axis gyro, no ABS. All it is is the OGTC, the original traction control down there on the right wrist. exciting to ride the weird thing about these YouTube videos is um, when you actually watch them back like that you can't believe how, how sped up it looks I mean we were just doing 40 mile an hour there along this nice little country road but when you watch it back like that it looks like it accelerates like mad it's a really odd sensation but anyway so yeah we said it's it's all about the analog input so with the modern bike you can potentially come up to a corner going a little bit too fast you can give it an extra squeeze of the brake to rely on the abs or turn it that little bit harder and you've got more capability in the bike with this kind of era of machine you've really got to be aware of the road you're riding it on where you're going and be set up for the corner as you get to it otherwise it really can catch you out as any litre bike on the road you have to you have to ride it with respect if you do that then it is a very very rewarding machine to ride wrist riding position when you're at slow speed through town as soon as you get a little bit of speed up and you get a bit of wind resistance on your chest completely takes the weight off your wrists and lets you steer the bike lovely through the corners and like I say it's definitely one of them bikes that just eggs you on to open the throttle the noise of it the pull of it uh, it's definitely something that just wants to be ridden harder and faster all the time but if you're not into riding riding them fast 
I mean luckily for this it looks stunning so you can stand at the side of the road or in your garage and appreciate it as well but really if you're not riding it at that sort of speed you're not getting the most out of what it was built for one point that I would say that I forgot to mention on the uh, not so good parts of it is these do absolutely eat batteries so they do suffer a bit of starting where they're a big 1000 CV twin and uh, there's a few upgrades you can do you can upgrade the start of solenoids you can increase the capacity of the battery but if you do get one that's a bit poor starting and you keep trying to wind it over it can damage the spread clutch quite easy so that is one downside to these but I mean I sort of put a battery in this every single year that I've had it and it's just one of those things that I expect really it's you know at least you're not there with a kickstart trying to kick the thing over and getting pinged over the handlebars so it's a small price to pay really for a bit of reliability the dash setup on this we've got digital uh, mile over here this is in kilometers at the minute as the battery's been off and come back on and it resets to kilometers so i haven't reset the dash so we've got our odometer down here our speed our rev counter bang in the middle which has got a shift light on there at the minute it's flashing at five six thousand rpm because again i haven't set that after the battery's been reconnected on the right hand side we've got the time and the temperature a little selection of buttons down the bottom there that you can use to adjust like i say from kilometers to miles and various bits and pieces on the dash we've also got on this bar here we've got this lap counter which is also the headlight main beam switch which if you flick that as you're going across the start finish line on the track it will record lap times in there and your v max your maximum speed things like that on the dash so you can really see with even though the age of the bike is an early 2000s bike what the purpose of it was what it was built for get a lot of attention wherever you go on this bike as well because it's a such a rare thing even though people don't know quite how rare it is just because of how it looks and sounds it does get a lot of attention wherever you go not really my cup of tea that thing I'd rather just get out and ride it and enjoy it but you know if you like going along to your bike meets or things like that definitely definitely will draw a crowd around it wherever you go Cycles or horns down the bottom, indicators just above it. Not on this Italian stallion, they swapped it around just to keep you on your toes. So, again, typically Italian. It's what they would call character. Bob Dabalina! <coughs> Mr. Dabalina, Mr. Bob Dabalina. quick 
shift are always obliquely on this, so if you want a, a quick shift, your back clutch and shift, it does have a kind of um, semi slipper clutch which is vacuum controlled from the engine, only works on a full closed throttle, but uh, again, the real analog feel to it. find some twisties and open the taps a little bit hopefully give you guys a bit of an impression of what it's like to ride on the road 130 odd horsepower we were saying to be honest with you nowadays with the torque from that big v twin it's more than enough for the uk british roads with how busy they are and the condition of them these new super bikes 170 180 wheel horsepower are just ridiculous on the roads really hence why the sales have dropped massively people are more into the super nakeds and the um, bobbers and sort of enduros bit clear road, I want to go mad, just have a nice spirited ride down some twisty good roads and take you folks along, the sun shines out, big big grins on our face So here we are guys, pulled up, found a lovely little spot in the British countryside that's been decimated by the railway. Still, they're paying my mortgage so I'm not to complain. So here we are, Brilliant RSV Milli R Haga edition. Uh, Nitro Nori, the Samurai Slide, this was the replica of his 2002 World Superbike. So, the standard Milli, 60 degree V-twin, 998cc. Uh, a prettier chassis, a prettier banana, lovely banana swing arm down there. And then the R edition had these gorgeous Olin's forks on there, coupled to these, I believe they're 320 mil Brembo discs and calipers, and these OZ forged aluminium wheels, anodized in a lovely blue color. They are a bit of a pain to keep clean, especially once it, it digs into the anodizing, the, the road dirt, but they do really set the bike apart. Uh, on this particular model, we've got a little bit of crash protection on it, crash bungs, if, any, if the worst does happen. We've got carbon fibre mug guards, little winglets, carbon fibre infill panels, uh, carbon fibre tray on the top of the dash up here. So the thing's dotted with carbon fibre all over it. 
Uh, this one has got a double bubble tinted screen as an additional extra. Have got the original screen obviously to go with it. And this has also got some Sato rear sets on, as we can see there. And these relocate the rear master cylinder from down here by the side of the engine and the exhaust up here out of the way of the heat. Otherwise they do tend to boil the rear brake fluid a little bit. Also these are adjustable. So the narrow or the short seat to peg height has been lengthened slightly, but I mean, I'm, I'm 5'7", and it's not a problem for me to fit on this bike. It's actually quite comfortable. Any super bike isn't gonna be particularly comfortable, but I could ride this a fair distance. Um, we've got the titanium exhaust heat wrap on there just to keep a bit of heat, and I think it adds a bit extra, something a bit different. Brembo rear caliper, like we say, it's an underslung caliper, and the bleed nipple's at the bottom. So when it comes to bleeding these, you need to unbolt this, take it around the top of the disc, bleed it so the nipple's at the top of the caliper and then refit it down the bottom. Uh, the main thing that sets this Harga apart are these lovely twin Akapovic pipes. The standard bike only comes with one silence or one side. So we've got no pillion foot pegs on this. We've got these carbon brackets which hold on to the Akapovic exhausts. Composite fuel tank, same as all the, all the um, RSVs. We've got the limited edition Hanadai's headstock here with the bike number and the Noriyuki Haga signature etched into it so that's a really really nice touch coupled with these Olin fork tops fork caps looks lovely Brembo master cylinder we've got a headlight cover on this just to protect the glass of the headlight and coming around the other side again very much a lot of the same you can see that lovely Olin's rear shock in there as well Sato rear set this side and the other silencer on the other side which is what really sets this bike apart with this seat hump on the back there so a beautiful beautiful machine looks lovely sounds lovely it still goes really really well a lot of value for the money with what, the amount of bike you're getting um, one thing we will show you actually whilst we're here is if we pop the boot off this generation of bike totally different to the modern super bikes so look at all that boot space in there for your sandwiches absolutely loads and loads of space the Aprilia toolkit in there most important part of this toolkit electrical tape so like I say everybody else sort of collaborated and built all the wheels and the, the good bits on the bike Aprilia did what they know how to do with the chassis unfortunately they also did the wiring so that is the main thing that lets these bikes down it's nice to keep them garaged under a cover out of the damp moist air definitely but yeah the toolkit's in there still loads and loads of space and an additional thing having this seat hump on here which is absolutely perfect is if you actually spin this over look at this we've actually there in this little recess panel we've got a dish we've got a dish for the carbonara Ay ay ay, mamma mia, how perfect is that? Here we go. Hello mate. Here we can see some of that typical Italian wiring in there. Oh, let's get away from that, put that back in there. So yeah, that's a, a little quick walk around the bike. Let's start it up, shall we? There we go, you see, that is a typical, a pretty RSV start-up. Will it start? Won't it start? Nobody knows. Please start. Please start.
there we go guys a little uh, a little walk around a little ride along on the rsv hopefully that's giving you a little bit of an insight into what the bike's about and what it's like to live with it i'm sure there's loads of stuff i've missed out and the people wanted to know i apologize for that so if there is anything you're querying please drop a comment below and let us know um, it's very difficult to try and remember everything that people are going to know about the bike whilst riding it along looking out for traffic at a reasonable pace so yeah drop it drop anything you want to know in the comments below um, this guy is definitely lost in front but thanks very much for watching look after yourselves and ciao for now